Uh, is it that off the wall? I mean, it is because they've obviously appointed Hayden Mullins, but uh, Damien Delaney at least with an idea there. What are you thinking, Owen? Yeah, it's not a bad idea whatsoever, and it's certainly not off the wall. I think they've got uh, two potential avenues if they hadn't gone with Mullins. They could have gone for the extremely exciting, or I mean exciting in press conferences and charismatic a la Sam Allardyce, or they could have gone for the most boring man in the history of football in Claude Puel. I think if you look at the odds for the next Watford manager, I think Claude Puel is actually the favourite, and he would be an extremely Watford appointment. I see Chris Hewton's in the mix as well. Uh, like third favourite at the moment but if you're Chris Hewton you, you surely cannot go to Watford if you're a manager with any ambitions to carve out a career path you just cannot go to Watford it's the best I, job in football what are you talking about you work for three months and you get paid for a year and you get a second job and you just don't have any offset language in it and like yes thanks very much I'll sign a three year deal please uh, like I mean do, do you agree with what Kenny was saying earlier on like I think this is I think this is ridiculous from Watford I, I, I just don't see how I, this turns out well. The, the way the players spoke about uh, the, the manager throughout the last few weeks has always been glowing. Nigel Pearson has always been somebody who has uh, attracted criticism for sure, but the, the cult of the manager ha has always been uh, quite pronounced when he has been manager of a club. And you Ben Foster saying it would have been a disaster a few weeks ago uh, if uh, he wasn't to be manager for the foreseeable future. Like If they get relegated... They well, if they get relegated... Uh, I mean, where, where, uh, the wages of sin are death, but it turns out in uh, football that's not actually the case. Uh, OTBAM is live in association with Gillette. We don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. It is 8.37, time for the papers. OTB AM. I'll run you through um, what's going on. When Jack fed the ducks, Ireland, England and Big Jack, Kieran Bradley's great thoughtful piece about the uh, relationship between England, Ireland and um, the North is live on OTV Sports now. You can uh, also get it on our app. Watford should go for Big Sam. It's Damien Delaney making that point yesterday and Nigel Pearson sacked with two matches left to go. John Ram is the new world number one. And we've got all the details from that on otbsports.com for you this morning as well. Very quickly, going to run you through the newspapers. The English newspapers all have De Gea. Uh, David De Howler is the Telegraph <laughs> front page, which may actually be tab of the morning for you. De Gea future in doubt after horror show. Kenny doesn't seem to think it is, but I'm not sure. Chelsea gifts, Chelsea's gifts from De Gea and Pearson acts after bust up. And uh, there's also cricket on the back of the Times UK. Again, there's De Gea going, ooh. It's a, it's a very familiar pose from David De Gea in the back of The Guardian this morning. Uh, trans women face potential ban from women's rugby. This is an exclusive from Sean Ingle. And um, Hamilton F1 is failing to take racism seriously. So Lewis Hamilton continuing to use his platform um, to make sure that the uh, the issue doesn't disappear. The back page of the Sun disaster, as in De Gea disaster. Did you get it, Owen? Did you get it? Uh, Axe Pearson out. New Hornets boss Mullins turns to Troy. So uh, Troy Deeney is essentially going to be asked to lead the team over the last um, few games. Uh, sweet puck all. Kilmacook Croaks distanced themselves from Ballyboden St. Enders yesterday by a whopping 14 points. Subs are having the crack with that. And uh, there you go. Class action. TD says, raise crowd cap for sake of pupils. We'll get to that in a minute. The logic of Peter Fitzpatrick is just a little bit difficult to follow. Not the first time, I've got to say. But anyway, uh, the Irish Times this morning has match reports from the FA Cup games and from uh, the return of Harry Kane to some form, which suggests that Jose Mourinho is going to be OK there. Um, and then uh, Malky Clerken has a piece about what it was like being in the press box yesterday for the game. And sorry, I had one more tabloid to do, which I'd missed, obviously. Now expect the Spanish Inquisition is what the mirror has taken. David Hayes' disastrous weekend in the Cup was. And uh, they also have Vica Rage Road. Pearson acts by Watford with two games left. Apparently he had a row with the owner. And it turns out you can't have a row with the owner at Watford because he sacks you. And then the examiner is uh, Chelsea leave Ole feeling blue and sweet win for Lampard. And also um, Daniel Storey's talking about concussion after the bye injury there as well. So uh, that's essentially the newspapers this morning for you. And the Irish Independent, Solskjaer defends the hay after latest costly blunder. They also have a photograph from the game between Rathnew and Bray Emmets. Bray Emmets hammered Rathnew for 13 to 12 points in the Wicklow Senior Football Championship round one game. 
and Jar Brennan is the manager of Brehem, it turns out. Um, I think I think Jar Brennan might still be playing football, I'm not sure, at uh, senior level. There was certainly strong speculation that he'd be lining out for Vincent this year as well, so he might be double jobbing. Um, but that's it's interesting, none of the lads there wear masks in that photograph. And in the, uh, in the Daily Mail, Michael Clifford is praising the GA for... Um, the GA advised all spectators attending games should wear face coverings, the kind of unambiguous advice badly missing from the government when it was most needed. Uh, so we're obviously going to talk about the, the government being under pressure in our pressure rankings um, a little bit later on, and we're going to talk about Peter Fitzpatrick saying that you won't be able to convince parents to send their kids to schools unless we can have 500 people at a GA match. As a, as a parent, I don't see how these two things are the same. I don't really see the connection between 500 people at a GA game and kids going to school. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm dumb. Maybe Peter Fitzpatrick is operating on a different intellectual plane from the rest of us, and he sees things we don't own. Maybe that's what's going on here. Possibly, yep. Yeah. Uh, as you say, we'll be getting stuck into that in the pressure rankings later on, but it is a kind of a, an unusual comparison, I guess. What's, like, so, so the point is that if you can't have 500 people at a GEA ground, you can't have people in school, or is it you can't, if you can't have people in school, you can't have 500 people at a GEA ground? Which I'm is a, the chicken and which is the egg here? I'm a firm believer if we want the schools to open in September, then we have to allow greater numbers to attend matches, because if we can't deem that to be a safe <laughs> thing to do in an outdoor environment, how are we going to convince people that going back to school is safe? There's a lot, of, um, a lot of misunderstanding of the science, I think. People kind of shaping things the way they want it to be, as opposed to uh, following trends and seeing what's happening. Yeah, like it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's something like, it's, it, that's on the, the back of the Irish Daily Mail this morning, isn't it? So, yeah. Like, so his logic is that the, the, the safest, if you were to pick a, one of the safer things to do at the moment, it is to, to be outside at an outdoor environment and everybody would be socially distanced and everybody would be wearing masks and uh, less safe than that will be kids going back to the classroom. That, like, that, that's his logic, is it not? Like, the, the, way, the way he's thinking about it, perhaps, is that in school, you're going to be indoors. In a classroom, you're going to have a greater chance of uh, contracting the virus. Um, like, I, I, like, I haven't... Like he hasn't done a reasoned decision on his comments, but like I wonder, is like part of it as well that it might be easier to control people at a match rather than kids in a classroom, or is that that, that maybe that's not true? Why, at all are, these why are we talking about this? I, look, I just think that um, since uh, John Horan came out and said no, we want five hundred at the matches, like hurry up, essentially. Uh, there's been a slew of county board chairmen out saying fairly similar stuff. In on one side or on the other side saying we might not even have games. We'll come back to this a little bit later on. Let's talk about some of the other stuff. The uh, Nigel Pearson situation, it turns out some of the papers seem to suggest that there was a fight after the match against West Ham um, and that they couldn't make it up all the way through until uh, eventually they sacked him but that they had actually wanted his assistant to take over and the assistant went, no, sorry, I'm going to be loyal to Nigel Pearson. So uh, that's why we've ended up with Hayden Mullins. Um, and that, that is the scenario with, um, with Pearson. Um, seems a little bit weird. Yeah, like it's, a, it, it's a weird club, in fairness. It's not, it's not exactly a, the most ideal situation. So, like, to kind of put it into perspective, like, but maybe if you look at it from the, the Potsdam's point of view, this is a brand new season. And if you're, ta like if you're taking the post-COVID lockdown as a brand new season, then things haven't gone very well for Watford. But... That's only one way of looking at it. The reality is that it is still the same season that we had before. And since then, he's done a pretty good job of taking Watford out of the crap and into a place where they probably won't get relegated. They might, but they probably won't get relegated. Or maybe this is like one of the most genius PR moves of all time, where the Watford hierarchy are like, we're definitely going to stay up. Yeah. Nobody, will, nobody, nobody is able to notice this. And if we manage to sack Nigel Pearson, we will get the credit for saving this club even if we lose our last two games and still somehow manage to stay up, we will still get the credit for doing all of these things. So I don't know, like it's very hard to get your head around any decision this club makes. I, I, you do think that they are kind of losing a little bit of their integrity. Like if they're going into the transfer market, for example, to try and bring new players to the club, uh, loyalty isn't exactly something that Watford FC 
can preach about if you're a youngster coming through there was kind of like a, a mercenary feel to the entire club and Nigel Pearson sacking is, is the latest in all of this like that being said it's it's the second time he's been sacked strangely over the last few years like we all thought that the Leicester sacking was a poor decision on their part and then Ranieri came in and they ended up winning the league so uh, things didn't turn out poorly on that front either but it is interesting that Craig Shakespeare did go with him uh, like it, maybe it's time to bring in Kike Sanchez Flores and give him a, a third go at the wheel. Um, no, but uh, uh, it is—it's a difficult job to sell to somebody, isn't it? Without question. Like, like but who who is doing the selling? Is it Pozzo himself, or, or is it a close ally of him who does the selling to a potential candidate? And it's like we're definitely happy to appoint you, even though you realise that if you do a, 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 an adequate job. Uh, he, they'll be happy to appoint you and then happy to sack you in a little while. They, maybe they just, like, I don't know, potentially like the attention and they like seeing Watford in the headlines and this is a surefire way of ha making that happen. I mean, I, look, I, the only thing, that you did, the selling point is that you'll get money for your full season and you might have seven months of sitting around doing no work and getting paid for it, which probably does appeal to some people. But in terms of a long term, trying to get there, maybe, maybe they change their minds and go for one of the firebrand young managers. Um, when you look at Southampton, who didn't sack their manager after the 9-0 defeat and have mm. subsequently been absolutely sensational, uh, I don't know. It, it's the, it, it, the Premier League is setting up to be relatively uh, interesting compared to how it has been for many years next season with Arsenal looking pretty decent. Uh, as an Arsenal fan, you must be feeling pretty happy about life at the moment. Well, they've done the two best teams in the country without being the better team. Well, they're possibly the better team on Saturday night. But they've done a number on to, to the two best teams in the country in the week that they got beaten by Tottenham last week, where you started to think, well, this is kind of more of the same, where Arsenal get back to a situation where they're creating lots of chances, but a shrewd manager like Jose Mourinho will always win in the end. The bad guy will always win in the end. And then all of a sudden, they somehow turned that on its head, where they ambushed Liverpool entirely. And then Saturday night, they were actually quite good, where their game plan is starting to make sense. The existence of David Luiz is starting to make a lot of sense. Playing a back three for the vast majority of the game, where Luiz looks very, very comfortable. They're playing in a formation that allows Lacazette to come deep and fulfill some sort of Roberto Firmino role. And he is looking exceptional in that role over the last few weeks. He kind of went up against Ilkay Gundogan quite a bit when Arsenal were without the ball on Saturday night and was brilliant without the ball. And there is a bunch of players who want to play for a club and all of a sudden you can feel something that isn't numbness when it comes to Arsenal, which is not a bad position to be in. That is always the first step for the anaesthetic to wear off. And uh, the, the anaesthetic has, has worn off a little bit now. And who knows what might happen next season. The problem is, like after beating Liverpool last was it Thursday night, Wednesday night, like Arteta was pretty quick to call out the board and say, no, we don't have the backing, we don't have enough finances, we need to spend big this summer. This is, it's kind of like now or never, if you're the Arsenal board, you've stumbled upon an ascending asset in management terms, a guy who really wanted to be here. It's very, very rare that this will happen again. This is the time to spend big, to put aside all your plans for future spending. Spend now or forever regret your decision to not do so. Yeah, um, I'm not sure that's going to happen. The situation with the uh, stadium in LA not being available because obviously California is not doing great with COVID as the rest of uh, America isn't. Are there going to be games? So Stan Kroenke's looking at his wealth over here going, Poof, and I'm not going to give you any money over here. So what if there's no money, right? What if this has to be uh, patched up and it's purely the guile and cunning of the manager? that you're going to be relying on for at least the next 18 months, which is a possibility. In that instance, what happens? I don't think they qualify for the top four in that instance. They, they might, if the first signs of cracking that we've seen at Manchester United in quite some time are actually more significant than we suspect, then there might be a top four space. Top two are a sign sealed and delivered. I, I know I put the question to Kenny earlier on about Chelsea potentially cracking that. That's because I think Chelsea are going to spend big and they're not going to move out of the Champions League places next season. So that's your top three covered, in my opinion, for next season. There is one place remaining for the Champions League and that is the only avenue with which Arsenal can explore where they can make their own money again. Can they finish ahead of Manchester United? And to be honest with you, ahead of Wolves and Leicester City, 
next season. I think they certainly can do the latter. But like, look at where Manchester United have been going over the last few weeks. The, 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 their signs of cracking are uh, small setbacks, but they are not terminal from Manchester United's perspective. If they get, I, I disagree with Kenny on David De Gea, if they manage to replace, replace the goalkeeper, it can have a Liverpool-esque effect in the way Alisson came in and was transformational in the way they played and, and the effectiveness of them at the back. That would be Manchester United then for me as the fourth Champions League spot, which leaves Arsenal in fifth. And with Arsenal in fifth, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang is leaving the club. And without Aubameyang, Arsenal will not be able to get into the Champions League places. We saw it on Saturday night. He's one of the best strikers in the world. Unbelievably clinical. Has been hot and cold at times this season, but he's still putting up incredible figures. The Mesut Ozil situation is emblematic of the failings of Arsenal over the, over the past couple it of years. It is, isn't it? So, somebody needs to grab Stan Con- Kroenke and Josh Kroenke and say to them, look at what you've got as manager of the club. The guy who got screwed over in the managerial process a few years ago has actually come back to the club because he loved the club so much. Very rarely will you have a genius who feels such uh, a suspected genius. He's not, he's not proven as a genius just yet, but a suspected genius who's got such a connection to a club who really wanted to come back to the club Make the most of this opportunity because you might have money down the line, but you may not have a manager as good as Mikel Arteta who is so energetic about the cause as well. So find the money. You say there might not be any money. Somebody needs to explain to them the importance of this summer and the importance of the next season because you're only going to have Aubameyang for so long and you might only have Mikel Arteta for so long. Yeah, and there is an opportunity at the moment to be a team who is a top four team every season and that brings back the Champions League football that you took for granted under Wenger, uh, so you've got to be careful what you wish for. Um, we should talk a little bit more about golf and John Ram being world number one mm. um, and everything else that happened at Memorial at the weekend. Uh, Ram is a, a cold, ice-in-his-veins killer, um, and I mean it's, it's great that he is a recent Irish Open champion for that tournament, but chances of getting him back to the Irish Open anytime soon might be uh, fairly limited. For sure. He, like, he's, he's going to be a major winner very shortly. You think about the last few weeks, how much we've spoken about Bryson DeChambeau. John Ram is probably more likely to be the next new winner over major, you suspect, over the next little while, as good as DeChambeau has looked. Uh, talk of a two-shot penalty that he should have taken last night, still would have won the tournament, perhaps didn't close it out as emphatically as perhaps it seemed earlier on. Uh, yesterday evening, uh, but another one in the calendar for him. But the, I'm not sure did he watch the Open for the Ages over the course of the weekend, Ger? It was this good. Was, like, I mean, it's been a, a, a great few months for Jack Nicholas. Not only has he managed to fight off coronavirus, he also won the Open for the Ages. So uh, he beat Tiger Woods by one shot over the course of the weekend. So I only watched a bit of it because it was weird. Like, it just, it just f- felt strange. It, it was real archive footage creating a, a fictional championship, basically, at St. Andrews. So it wasn't just random golfers thrown in and, you know, Nicholas being considered the GOAT automatically won it. It was how does the GOAT perform on St. Andrews specifically. And, yeah, he finished uh, one shot clear of Tiger Woods. Rory McIlroy, best of the Irish, he, he finished in a tie for sixth, if anybody didn't see this, with Louis Westhaven. Louis Westhaven did pretty well to to finish tied six with Jordan Speed and eight. Uh, the rest of the leaderboard was uh, Seve finished third on 14 under. Tom Watson and Nick Faldo were both on 13 under. And then Rory and West Hazen were behind them on 12 under. Uh, I think like we've got live sport back. We didn't need this, but it was uh, interesting all the same to see what the data was going to come up with. But the, the data is only half trustable here because there was 10,000 responses from members of the one club. On so, and I think they were, this was done on social media as well. So like, there's a, a certain element of the science that kind of goes out the window when you essentially put up a poll. But that's it. Good, good weekend for Jack Nicholas yeah. and John Ram. A, a double winner. Um, obviously, Tom Watson was on the latest episode of Golf Weekly. So wherever you get your podcasts, ideally you're getting your podcasts on the OTV Sports app. But uh, he was very generous with his time, gave, gave plenty of insight into some of the highs and lows of his career as well with the lads. So uh, I know all the golf fans out there probably already know about Golf Weekly, but for those of you who are just coming to the sport, it's a great introduction. You can subscribe to that uh, Golf Weekly. Um, <laughs> Ender wants to know, is this a, the golf version of the fight from Rocky? Didn't they do that in Rocky? Did they have Tyson fight <laughs> Stallone? Is that what happened? Did Mike Tyson? Yeah. <laughs> fight Sylvester Stallone in a was there a, was there did somebody did they put Ali up against 
there was some weird time warp that involves uh, dodgy enough technology, I think, for sure. That, that, that definitely rings a bell. Um, I, I can't quite remember the, the exact scenario now, but this was just archive footage. Like, they were, they were, it was pretty straight up saying that they didn't try and skew it or actually kind of show it as reality. This was just archive footage on uh, on St. Andrews, you know? So, um, yeah, the ex it, it is the version of that, as kind of ridiculous as that sounds. But, uh, like, it's curious that the top two were Jack Nicholas and Tiger Woods. Although, maybe that's just bluffing. Maybe, like, the person who, the, the person who's, like, typing up the scoreboard in, in their socially distant bedroom over the course of the weekend was like, yeah, Nicholas probably finishes first, Tiger Woods finishes second. That'll add base of hands. Uh, so I'm, I'm getting conflicting reports here. And, Rocky, they simulated a fight between, um, they simulated a fight and had the fight in real life, as in, you know, real life on the, in the movie. Um, so is whoever the uh, fictional equivalent of Mike Tyson would have been. Um, so it was, yeah. yeah. That's the whole point of a simulation, isn't it? To, like, who, who would win in the simulated fight between Floyd Mayweather and A.N. Other? Well, it turns out Floyd Mayweather always wins those in, in real life and in the simulations as well.